Hey folks, we're here at the Black Magic booth at NAB 2025. We got Matt from Black Magic here. Uh, he's going to tell us about the Apple Vision Pro, the immersive camera, and what we're looking for in the future. So, Matt, thank you very much for being here. Yeah, my uh, pleasure. My first question is just, what are you excited about with this camera? Why is this such a special camera? Yeah, it, it is a special camera. It was designed specifically to produce content for the Apple Vision Pro to their very high specifications. So I think when it gets in the hands of creators, they're going to be able to do things we've never seen before in terms of a level of quality and fidelity that nobody's really experienced yet. Yeah, we're all, we've all been waiting patiently for this because we've all just been stuck with what's on the market right now and yep. we needed those, needed more Ks. Right? Yeah, we want to make a great tool, you know, all the Ks, uh, but also a whole process that simplifies the workflow because it's been a bit of a science project up until now and we want to make it much more approachable to all the creators. What kind of technology is under the hood? Because uh, why don't you explain like sensor size, what's going on? Absolutely, yeah, so from about here back, it's the exact same camera as our Ursa 12K LF. That's our one of our flagship cinema cameras. And then from here forward, the big difference is, besides the lenses, uh, we actually have two of our 12K sensors. Uh, and each of those is uh, capturing a 180 degree field of view. And so you're getting about 8K per eye for that image circle. Um, other thing that's unique is obviously we have our two lenses here. These are over 180 degree lenses, though it gets cropped down to 180 for delivery. Um, they are fixed iris, fixed focus, and they're set at an optimum uh, f-stop to get the best result for these lenses. So chromatic aberration is really well controlled. And just It's all about fidelity for this camera. So we're capturing at a high resolution at 90 frames a second, and that goes straight through to the headset. That's awesome. Can this go higher than 90 frames per second? We'd love immersive slow-mo. Yeah, immersive slow-mo is very cool. Uh, uh, it does not shoot higher than 90 frames a second at our top resolution, which is that 8K resolution uh, for these lenses. Yeah. You bump it down, you go a little higher. Yeah, and currently we don't have other modes because that's kind of the minimum spec uh, to be considered Apple immersive video. So. Another big aspect of this camera and the whole workflow is these lenses are calibrated specifically to these sensors, and that calibration data lives on the Blackmagic RAW file that's then passed to Resolve, and then eventually to the headset where it is unwrapped dynamically in the headset. So we're shooting in lens space, we're editing in lens space, and we're delivering in lens space, and we're letting the Apple Vision Pro do the unwrapping of the image for the viewer to see. Uh, is there a time-lapse mode in this? Can we do time-lapses, immersive time-lapses? It's interesting, yeah. So all of our Ursa Cine cameras have a time-lapse mode. Um, I have not tested on this camera, so I'm not sure if that's an active feature, but I've seen it in the menus, I just haven't tested it myself. Nice. So, uh, TBD, I would say. Okay. Yeah. I see there, there are a couple screws, right? If, if these lenses got scratched, what would happen? Would we have to send it back? to Blackmagic, is there a replacement? Everything's calibrated, right? So it's gotta be fine-tuned perfectly. Yeah, so everything is calibrated. Um, so in terms of any damage to the cameras, we still have to kind of, you know, suss out what our program would be to address that. But it's something that I think is reasonable to assume that, you know, some items will get damaged, you know, uh, by some productions. And so I'm sure there'll be some process in place to handle that. How have you guys been filming with this? Do you put it on a boom arm that sticks out or on rails? Yeah. Because I see the rail. Um, yeah, we have this rail system. This comes with the camera yeah. uh, as well as the top handle. You can also mount the camera without it. Um, yeah, generally you want to basically mount this so it's a little forward on the tripod, maybe even uh, uh, got a, uh, a standoff plate to actually extend it further off the tripod so you're not filming the tripod legs so you don't have to paint those out in post. So that's one thing uh, I've seen done often. It's also been on crane arms, um, which is really nice for having a nice smooth camera move, absolutely. Have you put it on a drone? Yeah, it's been on a drone as well. Sweet. Absolutely, yeah, and it's, cool. there's a way to do it where you're actually putting it on top of the drone and you're cantilevering it out. So let's imagine you have a boom uh, across the middle of the drone. 
you have your batteries on one side that are counterweights to the camera that's just sticking out barely past the props. And so that way, when the drone moves forward, you don't even see the props. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. So you mentioned there are two 12K sensors on each side. That's right. Do you think maybe in an update, we'll be able to bump that up um, resolution-wise? I know you guys can do some black magic every once in a while and get us new features, like the new autofocus uh, I saw popped up. Yeah, so, so the 12K sensors, that, that's the maximum resolution for this camera. And we're getting effectively 8K out of it because it's 8K height on the 12K sensor oh, and it's a I circular see. image. So, uh, right, yeah. okay, so there's just a lot of wasted space that's not picked up. Yeah, and you know, we're kind of optimize it for the lens coverage, so we're getting that faster readout rate. Our Urso Cinema camera at the full resolution won't quite hit 90 frames a second, whereas this one does. Who do you think your main buyer of this is? Because for a lot of us, it's like sticker shock, kind of. And we have no idea how we can afford this thing right now, unless we rent it for a day or two. No, it's a, it's a good question. Yeah, so it's this is a very highly capable camera system you know shooting to a very high spec and the price reflects that it's you know basically a feature film cinema camera times two um, and the reality is you know there are certain productions that are going to be able to afford to buy that and there's others that are going to need to rent that and we expect there to be a healthy rental market um, yeah because it is a it is a higher sticker price than some of our other cameras but it's kind of in line with what you would expect for kind of a top level cinema camera. For the developer folks, are you guys working with the, I know Blackmagic has a developer uh, like section, right? Absolutely. You guys have a whole, a whole special space for them. Yeah. Are they getting access to any of these tools or the vision, the, the viewer app uh, mm. possibly? Like it, yeah. might, it would be cool for us to like get in there and mess around with stuff. and like. Absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, I think we've always had a very healthy developer community and APIs and SDKs, you know, really detailed and rich documentation. Um, I wouldn't expect this to be any different. Uh, at this moment, you know, we're, we're still developing the firmware. It's in a good place now, but it's going to continue to mature. And same thing with DaVinci Resolve. Uh, so I would look to the future for that. Um, this branch uh, of the Blackmagic RAW codec hasn't been uh, uh, integrated into the main branch, so it's not something that's available at the moment. Apple was pumping you guys up, talking about the partnership a lot. Mm -hmm. Are they still helping you guys? Are they still giving you information? Are you guys trading you know, yeah. features and trying to come up with new stuff? What's going on with Apple now? Apple has been a great partner through this whole process and, and really developing this camera and the post-production process through DaVinci Resolve um, has been a tight collaboration with them the whole time. Um, because, you know, we want this to be successful. They want it to be successful because they want people to make content for the Apple Vision Pro. Um, and so that's continuing uh, pretty much on a daily basis, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, we're, we're in constant communication. They just released that Vision Pro video utility app. Have you seen yeah. that? Yeah, the Apple Immersive Utility, yep. Does that only work with uh, 180 degree footage from the Blackmagic camera? Would I be able to use one of your competitors, 180 degree MV, if I got it into MV, HEVC first? Yeah, so what I would do is the, the Apple Immersive Vision, or sorry, the Apple Immersive Utility is a you know really powerful tool for creators so they can review content coming from our camera from DaVinci Resolve. Uh, there's detail about what it can support and what format it wants to receive uh, that you can access through their app store and a support link. Um, and it really gets into detail about what that utility does, how you can use it, what files you can feed it. That release and, that, and then you guys really, I mean, I was just like, oh, they must have released this because NAB is happening. Yeah. And yeah. it's another cool app and tool that you guys can have. Yeah, it's it, was, it was great. It really kind of completed that picture. Yeah. You know, you can get it through Resolve, but how do you get it to the headset? And yeah. that release is great, and time, share. great timing. And, sh and watch it with other people, like That's daily. Right. It's, if you could explain the, um, the workflow pipeline going from camera after we've shot some footage all the way through DaVinci and eventually to the headset, please. Absolutely, yeah. So 
let's say we've shot our day's uh, worth of footage, um, we can pop out our eight terabyte media module and we can load that into our media dock here. Oh, there we go. And pull the footage off of that. This is uh, connected via 10 gigabit ethernet and we can dump that footage to one of our storage devices, our cloud storage device or other devices. Uh, you can also actually access the footage directly from the camera over the 10 gig ethernet. But in all practical realities, you're probably pulling cards, continuing to shoot while somebody else is offloading the data. Uh, and so once you've done that, um, on Resolve, when you're setting up your project for the first time, you'll go to your project settings, and under master settings, you'll have an enable Apple Pro immersive workflow checkbox. And that does a variety of things to set up your project for you. Um, at this point, we're in a private beta version of the software, and it's probably going to do more stuff than even it's doing right now. Um, so we do that. All right, so actually in this case, so this media module is the module in the camera, and so I've mounted it here, so I can just drag these files in. And you see this was shot on the floor earlier today. It presents itself as a 3D clip. There's a little small 3D icon there. And what that means is that it's a stereoscopic file. There's both a left and a right layer to that. Yeah, so the 3D icon, and then you add those clips to your timeline, which we have this edit here. Very simple edit. You can add your transitions, your titles, etc. Um, and then we move on to the color page. And really, you do your color correction as normal. Um, the only real difference here, nope, let's go ahead and fit that, there we go. The only really difference here from a normal color correction session, and we have a lot of setup nodes there, we're not actually using all those at the moment, but we have access to the 3D panel. So the 3D panel lets us uh, switch between the eyes for preview purposes. So here I'm toggling between the left and the right eye. And in general, your color correction is going to work for both eyes, but let's say you were filming a concert and uh, a spotlight hit one lens more than another, you might want to correct one eye a bit differently. So you can unlink this box here and now correct just one eye. And so you can do a bit of an offset correction. A speck of dust. Well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you have a speck of dust or a tripod you need to paint out, you might go to the Fusion page where you have a discrete media in for your left eye and for your right eye, and then you do your work there. And Fusion is where you would do your titling also, right? Yeah, so Fusion, you can make custom titles. Um, there will be immersive titles you can apply right on the edit page. Uh, so Fusion's a node-based compositing application, so you can do everything from creating your own titles to doing high-end uh, visual effects and motion graphics all within this application. Yeah. Do you have any it, like templates, uh, and a, like a text template? Absolutely. Yeah, so we don't have an immersive one on this computer right now. That's coming in a very recent uh, update that we're going to be seeing. But our templates, if we go to effects and titles, we have all sorts of different title templates. So if we hover over some of these, we'll see. There we go. You'll see here this style or this style. So these title templates <clears throat> you can add to your project and you can actually modify from there and use them as a starting point. So absolutely. Um, so uh, on the color page again you do your color correction. Uh, right now we're seeing a feature that's unique to a, a, an Apple Pro immersive workflow where we're actually cropping the image out. We're defining the image circle. So if you're producing dailies you might choose to adjust that mask to crop out a tripod temporarily before actually painting it out. So you have, that's one of the new features uh, for the immersive workflow. That's helpful. Uh, when you're connected to a Vision Pro or it's on the same network, you can actually uh, output your edit timeline or your color timeline to the Vision Pro to do a live review of your timeline. So that's how you can check your work as you're progressing. Um, so it's early days for Resolve, but it's fully functional at the time to deliver. We're going to have more immersive tools coming online uh, as uh, we continue development. But the next big thing to talk about, I would say, would be the Fairlight page. And the Fairlight page is where you can do your spatial audio mixing. 
So we have full support up to fifth order ambisonics, Dolby Atmos or whatever fla other flavor you want to mix in. Um, and we will support the Apple format when that's fully published and whatnot. And so you'll be able to deliver your final spatial audio mix right out of Resolve as well. I did see the cube view that you guys offer, you know, and you can go through the different views. Yeah. What is what is uh, the camera look like? Oh wow, so it's it's really far, right? Because you guys have a stereo mic mm. in there. My footage from the R5C was like boop, right uh -huh, on sure. right on top of it. You yeah. Know? And it was just like a mono mm. thing that we get in. Yeah. But, so you can you can change the spread on any of these, uh, change the position. Right now we're just seeing this is our kind of a 3D panner. Our 360 panner, you'll see if we actually turn on ambisonics. Yep. Um, so under your preferences, video and audio I.O., you can enable ambisonics. And then let's go ahead and create a ambisonics bus. And you do that by going to Fairlight, bus format, and we'll add an ambisonics, let's say, third order bus. There we go. And we'll go ahead and route. There we go. Uh, we're going to route that to bus two as well. And now we have our 360 spherical panning window there. So not only that, you'll also see a heat map of where the audio is placed in 360 space or in lens space in the future. And so you'll be able to place your audio accurately oh, that's awesome. uh, for immersive. Yeah, that was a whole other app that people had to use. Uh, that's right. Uh, everything. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. So the less turnovers you have to have or zero turnovers, you're going to have yeah. a more efficient post-production process. Yeah, I think that's what we're all we've all been battling with this this workflow to finally get it to the goggles is like painful you know yeah. and it's just it takes so long and that's what my dream was to just like make something that i could just take the sd card put it in and boom you know it would do the converting yeah and finally get it into like an immersive player that's um, the goal the goal yeah. is to basically take immersive production from a science project to a video production style workflow yeah. And then for the end of the process, we go to the deliver page. And at the top of the deliver page, we have all sorts of different presets. And at the far right here, we have the Vision OS preset. So that'll set up your multi-view encoding and produce the files that you can load directly into the Apple Vision Pro through their new uh, immersive video utility. Yeah, I, I can't wait to like experiment and see what works and what you know because you guys are doing it so a little different you know a lot of us are working with side by side still yeah. most of the time yeah that's right um and so this is going to be really interesting to, to mess around with i think um, absolutely yeah we're really excited to see what creator is going to do with it and yeah. yeah the whole goal is make the whole process easier and more seamless but, awesome yeah. do you have a pair of vision pros are you super excited as well i am uh, very excited yeah yeah, yeah. i've I, I've done a fair amount of immersive work myself, and oh, cool. I've been waiting for not only a headset that this is of this quality, yeah. um, but a camera that can produce the content that's going to match that. Yeah. So I'm really excited. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, I really appreciate it, and uh, good luck with the camera. I can't wait thank to you. see what else you guys are coming out with, and we'll definitely keep in touch. Thank you. Awesome. Sounds good. Right. It's good to talk to you. Okay, man. Thank you. Cheers.